Good early morning, everybody. It's Lorraine Alternative Homesteading, October 5, 2024. I believe it's Saturday. And much, much later today, um, I'll do my usually Saturday, Saturday Night Live. Yes, Saturday Night Live. Um, approximately 10 p.m. Between, sometime between 10 and 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Anyway, I am powerful. You are powerful. And we are powerful together. And they're cowards. So before I get into what I'm going to talk about. Um, I mean, obviously everybody knows. Well, everybody might not know what's going on in North Carolina. Um, it's absolutely reminiscent of Maui. Ohio, you know, Palestine, Ohio, and probably all the other events that have happened historically in this country because we're controlled by psychopaths, greedy psychopaths. Well, guess what? FEMA says, now, we just don't have enough money for any more hurricanes this year. We have no more money. And then the, the dock workers there, you know, they're on strike. And they said, well, we might not strike a deal until January of next year. Well, how convenient. Meanwhile, there are people that have drowned, that are dying, that are stranded. They've lost their homes. I've watched videos of homes just floating away, floating down the river. And no one is going to help them except the regular people. There are people that ran out there. They've got their own private helicopters or performing a rescue and rescued several people. And then they got stopped in their tracks and said, no, no, you can't do that anymore here. Yeah, local sheriff said, no, you can't do it anymore here. And then they put an air ban on just the way they did at Maui by blocking people from leaving the islands. Why are they doing this? What are, they, are they trying to unalive these people? They don't want them to be alive to claim their lands back or to file a, uh, an insurance claim? That's right. Every person or vote. I know I'm beginning to sound like some tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist. But anyway, um, I suggested... FEMA, this is little FEMA, you know, with Homeland Security and the fusion centers. I have a wonderful idea. How about you just shut down all those fusion centers? Get rid of all those psychopath employees that are surveilling the entire population for your greedy pockets. To line your greedy pockets. And how about the millions and millions of dollars you're spending on that targeted individual program? You know, the one where they place innocent people on a list for the rest of their lives so that you can bilk the U.S. citizens billions of dollars to steal asset strip, destroy other people's lives, just like you're doing here in North Carolina. But anyway, there are a lot of good people out there that do come together when there are catastrophes. And um, I highlighted this YouTube creator in the past because they had been receiving some anxiety attacks that came out of nowhere. They were obviously being hit with some kind of directed energy weapon or pulse microwave radiation. And it turns out that their son, who has another channel, has identified, or, or I should say, the, what, what he described to be a gang stalker. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get into that another time, because I've got to contact him about what to do about this creature who's been following him and photographing him and acting like a nutcase. So anyway, um, there is a, a woman out in North Carolina who's got a fundraiser, a GoFund, GoFundMe going. 
And the GoFundMe isn't necessarily to buy a whole bunch of things or line in other people's pockets. What they're doing is there are multiple, multiple farms there. And a lot of the roads have washed away. So the farmers need help. They need help in harvesting what they grew. And they just don't have the help. They don't have the roads and stuff. And then there are other farmers there whose farms got washed away. So what this woman is doing is she created a GoFundMe to bring some workers in. And all those farmers who have food, who have grown food, all of it, all of it is being donated to these flood victims. And what the GoFundMe is about is to help the farmers who lost everything, all of their crops, to raise some money so that they can plant their crop for next year and recoup what it is that they've lost and also um, buy supplies and things for these survivors. So I'm just going to play a little bit about how they're going to rebuild the community here. It says, no FEMA, no problem. How this community rebuilds stronger together. That, let's cover that. People need food. People are without water, power, cell phone service, and food here. And so people need food. And uh, the farmers have food in their fields, but they don't have labor, they don't have fuel, and their markets are gone. Restaurants are closed, they can't deliver to CSAs. So there's there was this ironic situation happening where we need food and farmers have food. Um, they're donating their food. This one cleaning hack makes oh, years okay. of dirt disappear in seconds. Sorry Take any that, dirty that surface, spray over the grease or but we know farms are businesses too. That's right. And so they need money to cover their expenses. So we've started a GoFundMe campaign that's going to pay farmers directly for the produce that they are donating to relief organizations. Look, y'all, selfless service going on out here. There's tons of volunteers. A lot of them just drove off because you're using this as something of a staging point to get down to the places that are really, really hard hit. And um, this is a grassroots thing. I mean... So FEMA's not running this operation out here, are they? Not yet. Not, well, hopefully not at all. We're trying to keep it that way, yeah. So talk to me about what's going on here. I mean, what? how did this thing all come together, and how is it working out? Yeah, you know, honestly, I don't know who originally started it, but um, this business here, so this is the site of a local business, Nanostead. They build tiny houses for um, homesteaders, Nanostead. Um, that's cute. And they have Nano this stud. site that's relatively <laughs> convenient to downtown Marshall. So what they did is they opened up their entire business as a drop-off point for supplies. So what we're doing now is we're collecting supplies here, we're organizing them, we're distributing them to um, other organizations in town and other communities that are in need. There's also a shuttle service happening here for people that are going down to work in downtown Marshall because there's no parking. Um, they're, they're asking that nobody drive down into Marshall. So we're shuttling volunteers back and forth from downtown Marshall who are shoveling and helping with the cleanup efforts there. And we're also feeding volunteers here. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Anybody who needs food, and especially volunteers, can come here and get food. So they can focus on the important work of cleaning up and not worry about um, basic needs like food and water right now. Do these, do these places, um, is there a place for them to be housed or anything else while all this is going on, or everybody just kind of works that out? Most of the volunteers live here. Uh, the, these are just community members who are showing up to help the small business owners and, um, and infrastructure in Marshall to recover. Um, I don't know, you know, there's housing up at the early college for people right. who lost homes. Um, and, of course, lots of community members are opening up their homes to people who need housing, um, especially showers. But uh, there's no housing happening here, but pretty much everything else, all the other basic needs are happening here. Okay, we're going to end that. Now, also, um, there are several people out there, one of, them, of which is uh, Robbie Starbuck, who lives in Tennessee with his wife, um, he has been uh, quite the activist on the woke culture. Well, he and his wife decided to buy up all the starlings that they could find locally and hook them up for the people there. 
And they made a deal with Elon to give, you know, free service. And guess what? Elon got a little slap on the wrist from the FEMA. Yeah, like, no, you can't help them. Um, that's what was trending on Twitter, is that Elon was helping and also donating Starlings and, you know, free service and everything. And now they're coming back and uh, slapping him on the wrist. So what do you think that's about? Oh, no, no, it's just, it's just one of those, another one of those land grabs, right? Rumor has it that North Carolina has huge, like, has the world's largest lithium, uh, uh, yeah, lithium, like, for the lithium batteries, and quartz, like, a special quartz that's used in uh, computers and stuff, computer chips. But anyway, anybody who wants to donate, there are several valid places to donate. I donate to a um, an organization called Grindstone Ministries. Um, it's Bear International on YouTube. And he also set up a Caleb house, K-A-L-E-B house. And this is for rehabilitating children who have been, you know, the traffic lighted. And um, so each year, um, he, what he does is whenever there's a disaster, he has groups and groups of people that donate their time and equipment. And he'll set up an Amazon wish list of all the items that they need. So he make, makes it very easy. Like he did this when uh, Kentucky had the floods and stuff. So you go onto the wish list. Um, his name is already there. You just find his charity. Um, click on it. The address automatically populates. You don't have, really have to do anything. You add the items to the wish list. And also on his channel every other day or so, They'll have an update on what's needed at that time. So, and it, it's not always on the wish list. It's just items that they've discovered over the last few days that they really do need there. So I know targeted people, I mean, we're already stretched to the max, but these people have lost everything. And, um, you know, anything that you donate is a wonderful. I, um, um, as you know, um, these criminals have been radiating my eyes since the middle of May. Um, they stopped for a little bit while and they started to heal. Now they're starting up again. So I looked online um, for some kind of radiation relief, radiation cream. And, you know, perhaps everybody should have a tube of this on hand, given the way of the world and those things that are flying around and zigzagging in the sky and stuff. It's by Derma Vitality. By Vitality. It's radiation relief cream. It's I've got have the unscented one. It's hydrating and soothing. It is. Um, it has calendula cream for radiation, natural organic paraben, and phthalate free. Um, it's got 4.5 stars here. I just ordered it. So it's formulated with organic lavender oil, aloe vera, calendula oil, jojoba oil, shea butter, vitamin E and B, green tea, yarrow, spirulina, and wild geranium. It relieves painful, dry, itchy skin. And let's see what else it's got going on here. It moisturizes, soothes, and comforts. It provides ultimate comfort to compromised skin. This is what it looks like here. So I just ordered it. Haven't used it yet. The ingredients look wonderful. Right here. So I also received a comment. I received a, a bizarre comment. Um, and I'll read it to you guys. And it's by a YouTube creator called Deep State Gang Stalker One. Hello, I'm a deep state reptilian from sector known as Sand Gap. Now, Sand Gap is a town not too far from here. I am here to inform you that I'm in your walls and you must peel the vinyl siding off your walls 
to get the illegal alien microtechnology sent from the Yakubian Deep State Project out of your walls to stop evil energy from intruding on your mental new, new sphere. Oh my goodness gracious. Uh, they're coming out of the walls, literally, these people. Now, you know what? I'm not going to invalidate it or validate it. Other than that, my house was built by the Amish, and I'm the only person that's ever lived in it. And it came with the vinyl siding already on the house. It's not that it had to be built here or something like that. So anyway, I do believe that there are deep state reptilians. Um, I had to look this up, that this Yakubian deep state project. I had to look it up. And it's quite bizarre. It's something about a, a research scientist just doing some bizarre research and stuff. But I'm not going to entertain it so much other than, you know, I know a lot of people don't read the comments. And I just thought this was one of one of the most bizarre comments I've received in a while. Um, helpful, I'm not sure. Probably one of the most helpful comments I've received recently was about <laughs> somebody local knowing Scarlet. And how she's not part of them. And how her son-in-law is not the sheriff. You know, she lie, lie, lies. Just like everybody else around here. But anyway, let's get into it. So I'm powerful. You are powerful. And we are powerful. And they are cowards. They're little teeny weenies. They've got little weenie issues. So I was thinking up some new songs. You know, I'd like to create some gang stalking songs today. And uh, when, when I've got it all figured out, I'll share it with you. Well, you know, the real enemy of the state, hint, hint, it's corrupt officials and sheeple people. What else here? I have a Q&A that I'm going to read. TIs, targeted individuals, their crimes against humanity by subhuman psychopaths. They target independent thinkers who care about the world and people. They target those who are empathic, intelligent, and have possess a moral compass. They're change agents, and they fear us. They're afraid. They're so afraid of us. Oh, my goodness. They're cyber stalkers. They're gamers. They, they create parody channels to use to harass, stalk, and embarrass targeted people, and other people, too. And what do we do? How, what do we do to combat these creatures? Right? The predators on patrol. You know, the pops. The pedos on patrol also pops. The wops. The witches on patrol. The cops, criminals on patrol. The mops, the morons on patrol. We expose them. That's what we do. We expose them. We expose the organized persecution, the smear campaigns, the warnings about the target, all the tactics, and the gang-stalking subculture. They are a cult amongst themselves. They think that they're so special. They're not special. They're being used. <laughs> and you know what happens when people like that are hired and they know too much? They get rid of them. That's right. They, they, they have to get rid They have to get rid of them. They have to because for any surviving... Uh, targeted people that decide to sue them. They have to get rid of these people. They don't want these people testifying. What are you kidding? <laughs> oh, yes. We expose the witchy poos, their crap, their wops. You're banished. Poof! You're gone. And they're all complicit. Every one of them is complicit. They think they're special. So, so arrogant. Entitled. They're greedy little effers. But anyway, let's get back to our Q&A. Okay, so what's the questions? Let me grab hold of this. And I, I hear an animal on my porch now. <laughs> there are a lot of animals out and about this evening. Okay, so... I, I, I wanted to try out the feature on creating paragraphs on ChatGPT. So... I, I asked, I said, could you write me seven paragraph essay on cause stalking, vigilante stalking, community harassment and its history and who's involved at the federal level? 
How is an innocent person nominated and why into the slow kill program? Cause stalking is a form of targeted harassment. Cause stalking, also referred to as vigilante stalking or organized stalking, is a phenomenon where individuals are systematically harassed, surveilled, and intimidated by a coordinated group. Keyword, coordinated. This form of harassment often involves a network, another keyword, a network of individuals working together to target a specific person. Typically, someone viewed as a threat or undesirable for the group. Is this ridiculous? Oh, yeah, I am a threat because I'm going to expose y'all one by one, one by one. The harassment can take various forms, including following the target, damaging their property, spreading false rumors, which is called slander and defamation, engaging in psychological manipulation to cause distress, you know, like spreading poopy toilet paper on the driveway at 12.03 a.m. caught on camera. What makes cause stalking particularly insidious is that it operates outside of the law, with perpetrators often justifying their actions under the guise of community protection or moral duty. Yeah, they're, they're moral, all right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. This is a psycho. They're psychopaths. Vigilante stalking and community harassment. Vigilante stalking is a type of cause stalking is the practice where ordinary citizens take it upon themselves to quote-unquote police or punish individuals they believe deserve punishment. Now, I have to tell you guys, when I moved here, I knew no one. How would anybody in this community know anything about me or believe that I deserve punishment when I never met a soul? In this context, I'm, I'm drinking something here too. The vigilante stalkers act as a judge, jury, and executioner, bypassing any legal system or formal process. They collaborate. It's another key word. They collaborate in groups, often supported by community members or even law enforcement, making it incredibly difficult for the victim to escape. The tactics used are similar to those in psychological warfare. Isolation, gaslighting, and relentless surveillance. Community harassment, also known as mobbing, occurs when a large portion of a community is enlisted to engage in these acts, making the target feel unsafe no matter where they go. In the historical context and development, the concept of community harassment, or cause stalking, has roots in various social control mechanisms throughout history. During the Cold War, governments used covert methods of surveillance and psychological warfare against perceived threats, and these tactics have evolved into modern-day forms of harassment. Similar practice can be traced back to McCarthyism, where individuals were blacklisted or persecuted for their political beliefs. And then there's COINTELPRO, a secret FBI program designed to disrupt political organizations through surveillance and her harassment. These historical instances laid the groundwork for the development of community harassment, which now includes private citizens taking up the mantle of law enforcement, and which is essentially a form of psychological torture. Yeah. My favorite bureau of instigation. Yeah, there's not enough crime out there. They have to instigate people. Now, what, what about the federal involvement, intelligence and surveillance programs? While community harassment is often driven by private citizens or local groups, federal agencies have been implicated in the broader context of surveillance and social control. Programs like the FBI's COINTELPRO mentioned earlier were designed to monitor and disrupt political activists, particularly those involved in civil rights movements or anti-war protests. 
These surveillance programs have set a precedent for how federal intelligence agencies can influence local law enforcement and community, which is why the sheriff can say, no, I don't want you guys in my jurisdiction. So you know the sheriff is corrupt when they allow them in. Although direct evidence of federal endorsement is of cause stalking is scarce. Some victims claim that the surveillance and harassment they experience are facilitated or at least ignored by federal agencies blurring the lines between private and government actions. So I also ask about the nomination process, how innocent people can become a target. An innocent person may become the target of cause stalking through various means. Often they are nominated, this is key here, by someone with a personal vendetta, personal vendetta, or by individuals who perceive them as a threat to community values or safety. I don't know, guys. The people that are harassing us, they are a danger to society, community values, or safety. This can occur in workplaces, neighborhoods, or even online communities. Once a person is labeled as a quote-unquote troublemaker or undesirable, a campaign of harassment begins. What is particularly disturbing is how easily an innocent person can be misjudged and placed into this quote-unquote slow-kill program, a term used by victims to describe the long-term insidious nature of the harassment. False accusations, misunderstandings, or being at odds with someone influential can lead to a person being targeted, even if they have committed no crime. Why an innocent person becomes a target. The reasons behind why an innocent person might be nominated for this form of harassment can range from personal grievances to more systemic motives. In some cases, a victim may have exposed corruption, criticized a powerful person, or simply refuse to conform to community norms. Oh no, I never did any of those things. No, no, I never exposed corruption. I've never criticized a powerful person. Uh, I don't know, maybe 50 times. I don't know. Or simply refuse to conform to community norms. I, I absolutely refuse. In others, they may be perceived as mentally ill, eccentric or politically radical, leading people to justify the harassment as a form of quote-unquote correction or social policing. Well, I'm going to tell you folks where I live now, these people are depraved, lunatic, white trash, disgusting. I mean, at least in New Jersey, when I was targeted there, at least the people looked nice, dressed nice, were somewhat polite. They didn't yell obscenities out of their their vehicles. They didn't throw stink bombs and trash. I mean, these people are really absolutely despicable, disgusting. I'll look forward to moving to suburbia or someplace where the people have a brain and can think for themselves. Anyway, uh, they'll probably have to pay a little bit more to the gang stalkers when I move. <laughs> Here they can get away with paying them a lot less money. Is the cost of living is so much lower. Once identified, the individual may face a relentless campaign of intimidation, which includes surveillance, defamation, and isolation. This harassment can last for years, eroding the victim's mental, emotional, and even physical health. In conclusion, a slow kill program is one of psychological warfare. And the term slow kill, quote unquote, is used by victims of cause stalking to describe the long-term psychological damage inflicted upon them through these coordinated campaigns. The harassment is not designed to kill the target outright, but to gradually wear them down over time, leaving them socially isolated, emotionally broken, and sometimes financially ruined. Whether driven by personal vendettas, misguided notions of community safety, cough, cough, or systemic corruption, cause-stalking represents a serious violation of human rights. 
Without more attention from legal authorities or human rights organizations, this form of psychological warfare may continue to fly under the radar, leaving its victims trapped in a cycle of fear and torment. So, it is absolutely acknowledged that this happens. And a personal vendetta to put somebody in a slow kill program for the rest of their lives? A personal vendetta? Do you have any idea how many people that piss me off that I don't like? Um, I just ignore them. It's, it's just easy. It's a much easier to ignore somebody. And also, karma-wise... You know, if, um, if you ignore somebody and they continue to harass you, that's when you start recording and videotaping, which leads me to the next question here. How to deal with, document, and combat and prosecute this cause stalking, community harassment, vigilante stalking, Involving corrupt police and lawyers. Understanding the challenge of cost stalking and vigilante harassment, especially when it involves corrupt police and lawyers, is an incredibly difficult task. This form of organized harassment often involves multiple individuals acting in coordination with the aim of intimidating, surveilling, or harming the target. When those involved include corrupt law enforcement officers or legal professionals, the challenge grows exponentially as they may shield the perpetrators from consequences or use their influence to further intimidate the victim. Oh, yeah, that's what's happening here for sure. Yeah. Yeah, they never prosecuted my neighbor next door, the ski mask man who tore out my brand new gate with his John Deere tractor in front of a witness and his 15 year old son documenting the harassment you've got to build a solid case one of the most critical steps in dealing with cost stalking or community harassment is to meticulously document every instance of harassment which is why sending cease and desist letters to your tormentors the ones that you know is really important because you've got it documented the importance of evidence cannot be overstated, particularly when corrupt officials may inv be involved. Victims should keep a detailed log of all incidents, including dates, times, location, and any individuals involved. They should also gather photographic or video evidence whenever possible, as well as collect physical evidence such as vandalized property or written threats. Recording phone conversations where it's legal Saving emails or text messages or having witnesses to corroborate events are also essential to building a case that will stand up in court. And what about co combating the surveillance and harassment tactics? In addition to documenting incidents, victims need to actively work to combat these tactics used by their harassers. Many perpetrators of cost stalking use surveillance, psychological manipulation, and misinformation to wear down their targets. Victims can reduce their vulnerability by taking steps to protect their privacy. This might involve installing security cameras around the home, using encryption for electronic communications, and being mindful of their personal security when in public. Victims should also take steps to safeguard their mental health as psychological manipulation is a key weapon of community harassment. Building emotional resilience through therapy, support groups, and self-care is crucial to withstanding these campaigns. So and what are the legal strategies? You really need to find a trustworthy lawyer and support. It's essential for anyone attempting to fight organized harassment especially when corrupt lawyers or police are involved. Victims should look for attorneys with experience in civil rights law, whistleblower protection, or cases involving harassment. Independent legal organizations or civil liberty groups such as the ACLU may be able to provide guidance or refer victims to credible lawyers. Filing civil lawsuits, restraining orders, or protective orders can be a useful way 
in to start creating a paper trail, a legal paper trail. Even if the system is slow to respond, having legal documents on file helps establish a formal record of harassment. This is why even if you don't win a lawsuit, you have documented this in the court. And those records, you know, those can be public records. You can locate them again. You can get transcripts of those, those hearings. So that's why it's very important. And, they, and then it also exposes the names of the people involved when you file a lawsuit or a claim, any kind of claim, the smallest amount of claim with the court. It does set a paper trail so that the next time you go into court, you can clearly demonstrate that this has happened systemically over time with groups of people. Engaging external oversight agencies. In cases where corrupt police officers are involved in the harassment, it is crucial to escalate the matter to external oversight bodies. Victims can file complaints with internal affairs divisions within the police departments. That goes nowhere, guys. It's like uh, they investigate their own selves and find nothing's wrong. Although this may be insufficient if the corruption is widespread. Alternatively, victims may seek assistance from higher level government agencies such as state attorney generals. But that hasn't worked here or in New Jersey. Federal agencies like the Department of Justice or independent organizations like the National Police Accountability Project. Oh, they're good. That's a good group. This, these organizations have more authority to investigate claims of corruption, police misconduct, and civil rights violations, increasing the chances of holding corrupt officials accountable. And remember, there's that Brady list. You can report attorney generals. You can report... Uh, police officers and attorneys to the Brady list. And then you can leverage media and public awareness, like what we're doing now. Public awareness can also be a powerful tool in combating cause stalking and community harassment, especially when official channels are failing. Victims should consider sharing their story with a trustworthy journalist or media outlets that specialize in exposing corruption or civil rights abuses. It's sort of like going to neighborhood wars on A&E, April 11, 2023, and you could see my sorry-ass neighbors there being carefully highlighted for their abuses. It's a joke. So, yes. It's about exposing them. If they want to participate in these illegal felonies and misdemeanors, then we need to expose them in a public way. That's the way we get even with these people and expose them. And we also create a paper trail by doing so. Whistleblower organizations and advocacy groups may help amplify the victim's voice drawing attention to the injustice and potentially pressuring authorities to take action. In some cases, public outcry can prompt investigations or lead to reforms that make it harder for corrupt officials to operate unchecked. And how about prosecuting these perpetrators? A criminal and civil roots. Prosecuting individuals involved in cause stalking or community harassment, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. Once evidence has been carefully documented and a legal strategy is in place, victims can pursue both criminal and civil actions against the harassers. Criminal prosecution may involve charging individuals with stalking, harassment, conspiracy, or corruption, or all of the above. If police and lawyers are complicit, Federal prosecutors may become involved under laws relating to organized crime or civil rights violations. And on the civil side, victims can sue for damages related to emotional distress, property damage, defamation, and loss of income. Success in court requires thorough preparation, but victories are possible with persistent 
efforts. And in conclusion, persistence and resilience in the face of corruption. Dealing with cause stalking, community harassment, and vigilante stalking when corrupt police and lawyers are involved requires immense persistence and resilience. By carefully documenting the harassment, securing trustworthy legal help, protecting your personal privacy, and engaging external oversight agencies, victims can begin to push back against their harassers. While the road to justice may be long and fraught with difficulties, especially when facing systemic corruption, every step taken to expose and combat these acts is a step closer to accountability. Public awareness and legal victories can shine a light on these dark practices, helping not only the victim, but also others who may face similar abuse in the future. So anyway, I hope uh, you enjoyed that Q&A. And you all know that my favorite Bureau of Instigation, they're the ones, they've got the lists. They're the ones that have the lists. And according to the ACLU, Trapped in a Black Box, Growing Terrorism Watch Listing PDF that you can find on my channel and online, the ACLU in 2016 published that document and it was based upon FOIA requests of the FBI and the information they received back were for the years 2006 to 2008. So eight years later, the ACLU publishes this very long PDF, very detailed. And at that time, the hand, the written document of 2016, based upon 2006 and 2008, specifically stated that there were 900,000 innocent people on a list, some lists, no-fly list, a black list, whatever list, a list, list, list. There's multiple, multiple lists. Once you get on, you don't get off. They just shuffle you from list to list. So now, if it was 900,000 in 2016, based upon like 2008, that's eight years, what do you think it is now? We already know it's in the millions. And that's just in the United States. So anyway, this is Lorraine Alternative Homesteading. I'm going to sign off for now. I hope everybody enjoyed this. Please leave a comment down below. Um, if you found this useful, you can sure, certainly like, hit the thumbs up. It helps the channel grow, get the message out there, and you can share. And um, I'll look forward to you tomorrow, later, tomorrow. It's already tomorrow. Um, I'll have a live chat sometime between 10 and 10.30 p.m. Signing off for now.